So we became interested in doing that because my laboratory has processed probably like 5,000 surgical specimens. And when you see the tissue falling apart, you realize that there is actually tissue destruction. And so we asked the question, well, if the epithelial cells die, do they release something that activate <coughs> an inflammatory response? And we use a very simple system in which we use the cell line HC29, which is an epithelial cell line, and we <coughs> either sonicate them or do cycles of freezing and thawing. And then we take the supernatant and we put them on an indicator system which are either endothelial cells or mesenchymal cells. And we ask the question, do they induce uh, uh, production of cytokines? And we measure usually IL-6 and IL-8. If you look here, you can see that <coughs> if what we call HIF, human intestinal fibroblasts, are exposed to necrotic cell supernatant, <coughs> you can see that there is an induction of very high levels of IL-6 and IL-8, which are higher than optimal dose of LPS or even TNF. So there is something there, a necrotic cell product, that causes production of chemokines and cytokines. So we start asking the question, where is this? Is this in the soluble fraction or the insoluble fraction? And at this level, <clears throat> both the soluble fraction, the supernatants of the pellets appear to do it. But always the soluble fraction is more powerful. <clears throat> so uh, this is work by Ellen Stiliano and Melania Scarpa, which are my associates. So we ask the question, what in the supernatant is responsible for the induction of a pro-inflammatory cytokine production? So we decided to do experiments like <clears throat> RNA depletion or protein depletion and so on. And if you look at these responses, basically if you destroy RNA, which is a dump, it doesn't do anything. But if you destroy proteins, you have a substantial drop. And if you add the two, you have a further drop. So there is something which appears to be proteic that was inducing this response. Then we asked the question <clears throat> about the cytosolic proteins. And uh, <clears throat> what we did here, we asked the question if it was proteins from the cytosolic fraction or the nuclear fraction. And it was clear there was the cytosolic fraction, something that was present in the cytoplasm. And then <clears throat> we thought that perhaps something like I1-alpha is present. I1-alpha, it's one of the molecules of the family of interleukin-1, which is now, you know, about 12 members or so. And I1-alpha is a very powerful pro-inflammatory cytokine, but is never secreted. It's either intracellular or bound to the surface, unlike I1-beta that is so popular and is released in the environment. So when we block the interleukin-1 receptors, then we basically eliminated the response, which means that some members of the R1 family was involved. They all bind to R1 receptors. And then we did, we asked the question, well, is there alpha or beta? And if we block interleukin-1 alpha, but not interleukin-1 beta, we basically eliminate the response. Strongly suggesting there was interleukin-1 alpha, the intracellular dump causing the inflammatory response by the fibroblasts. This was from HT29, so we asked the question, well, do actual ex vivo human cells do that? So we compare HT29 to freshly isolated intestinal epithelial cells, THP1 cells, which are monocytic cell line, monocytes, polyformonuclear leukocytes, and lamina polyformonuclear cells. And all of them did the same trick. And in fact, I1-alpha is present in all cells of the body. So the disruption will, by necrosis will liberate interleukin 1-alpha. Then we did blockade specifically of interleukin 1 alpha, and also we eliminated the response. So we were pretty sure the interleukin 1 alpha was the factor released by petil necrotic epithelial cells inducing the, the chemokine production. <clears throat> then we asked the question is the interleukin 1 alpha that caused the response, the one that comes exogenously from necrotic cells, or the interleukin 1 alpha in the fibroblast themselves is part of the response? And when we did <coughs> RNA silencing <coughs> of I1-alpha in the target cells, there was no effect. But when we blocked I1-alpha in the, in the epithelial cells before we generated the necrotic cell supernatant, then we blocked the response by about 50%. Again, suggested the interleukin-1-alpha was the factor. <coughs> 
what I'm not going to show you is everything else that is not causing the response. And this was very painful for the postdoc because she started to do all these controls and nothing <laughs> was working out until we zero in or into looking one alpha. But these are all potential dumps that can cause the response or receptors for it. Then we said, but if we're looking one alpha causes inflammation, can we show that in an animal model? So what we did, we'd give enemas of interleukin-1 alpha to C57 blacks. And <clears throat> with the PBS enema, which doesn't do anything to the mucosal barrier, we could see already some mild response is not very dramatic. But when we do the ethanol enemas with dissolved mucus and then allows penetration into the submucosal tissue, we could see a very dramatic inflammatory response. So interleukin-1 alpha by itself can induce colonic inflammation. And in fact, when we did the immunofluorescence and confocal, you can see interleukin-1 alpha stain of epithelial cells. And from day zero to day 13, in the upper part of the colon, which is usually not much inflamed, you can see the shedding of epithelial cells, which are interleukin-1 alpha positive in the lumen. And when you look down in the rectum, where inflammation is more intense, you can see interleukin-1 alpha positive cells in a Freud inflammatory response. And then we took the stools of the animals at different days, and we measured the presence of I1 alpha in stools, um, sonicates, or if you want, suspensions. And we found interleukin-1 alpha. So we think that interleukin-1 alpha probably is an important component of an inflammatory response in the bowel as long as there is necrotic cell death. We tend to talk only about apoptosis. Until 15 years ago, the cells were dying by necrosis. If you look at the literature in the last 15 years, the cells don't die by necrosis anymore. They die by apoptosis. But in reality, even apoptotic cells, they eventually fall apart. So it's an example of a relatively new component that is now understudied, but in the, in the field of dump, interleukin-1 alpha is a major mediator inflammatory response. And I think this is a nice example of how, in a classical model of model of IBD, yeah. if you believe that, you know, you have both a an, an bacteria-derived component and a tissue necrotic-derived component, which probably reflect more the normal pathophysiology of a disease process in the gastrointestinal tract. It's impossible to separate both. And that's maybe one of the reasons why modulating the flora only in chronic disease doesn't do the trick because there is continuous cell damage, then you have continuous baseline inflammation derived from endogenous lichens. So this is a potential model in which we have in the lumen dietary antigen and teriflora, pathogens, xenobiotics, and depending on the circumstances, you know, breakdown of the mucosal barrier, you have a primary response by immune cells, and the inflammatory response causes cell death, and obviously by cell death, you have a secondary response with an inflammatory response activation, then you have another cycle, and you go on until you become chronically cycling from perhaps a single agent to one trigger, xenobiotic pathogen, but then the tissue response in itself leads to a continuation of the inflammatory process. And again, healing of the mucosa is actually very good, perhaps because we can interrupt this cycle. Just a word about other components that are, fine, that are coming up in the study of IBD. Epigenetics, which is the ultimate regulatory mechanism of immune response, I finally entered the field of inflammatory bowel disease by modulating the chromatin structures in a line promoting opening or closing. And uh, now we have not only the microbiome or the immunome, well, now we have the epigenome, everything that modulates our immune responses. In IBD, going again from birth to developing a disease, everything you are exposed to is part of the epigenome. Maternal factor, toxin, diet, aging, and so on. And what we're exposed to now also has a name. It's called the exposome. And believe it or not, you can do EWA studies for the exposome as you do GWA studies for the genome. And the, there's already publications in the area where they look at risk factor for diabetes type 2. And you basically apply the same mathematical models that you use for genome analysis into EWAS analysis to determine risk factors.
And this is something that will be very interesting to do in IBD, take a population of young individuals at risk for IBD, follow them up, or people that just develop IBD, retrospectively analyze the risk factors and analyze them to see which one of them is more important.